Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this IORMA webinar, Reinventing the City High Street. Uh, my name is David Wortley. I'm the Virtual Conferencing Director at IORMA, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to this event. Um, before we get started, I just want to say a few words about IORMA uh, and also to uh, do a few housekeeping items. Well, these IORMA Consumer Commerce Centre, it's a neutral resource for businesses and governments that recognise their need to understand and respond to the ways in which the 7.8 billion global consumers are changing. And these consumers are changing in the products and services they want and need and the ways in which they want to obtain them. And these changes are happening globally, driven by developments in society, in business, and in technology. So I almost organize these, these webinars to bring experts in different aspects of this area together uh, to share their views and debate and invite delegates to ask questions and also share their experiences. So the housekeeping bit from me uh, is to ask you kindly if you would use the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of your screen if you want to ask any questions rather than the chat button. Please only use the chat button if you want to communicate with yourself or any of the panelists uh, individually. Uh, and so uh, with that, um, I'm going to bring in all of the panelists I'm going to disappear uh, and I'm going to hand over now to Kirsten Pottinger, um, who will be looking after you for this session. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, David. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kirsten Pottinger. I'm delighted to be moderating today's webinar um, on behalf of IORMA, uh, sponsored by Validify. Um, just to give you a brief intro to uh, who I am before I um, get each of my panellists to introduce themselves. Um, I'm currently Director of Communications for uh, a new startup actually called Vidia, who are currently working, um, just launched in June of 2020 this year in the thick of the pandemic, um, working with three of the top universities on developing a rapid tested, uh, testing COVID kit. Um, so very apt in the current times. However, um, my, my true background uh, my, in running thick in my blood is retail with over 20 years uh, retail operations experience uh, from hanging up deliveries on the shop floor right through to uh, seeking out new channels in my most recent role with Fatface <coughs> as head of global partnerships. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this particular uh, subject of webinar is very close to my heart. Um, and you know, clearly there is a huge deal of change on our high streets um, and our, city, our local high streets in our cities at the moment, uh, which are impacting uh, the ways that we've historically done things. Um, I'm just going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves before I give a brief summary um, of, of what will be, or why we're covering and what we're covering today. Uh, we then have some really, um, I think, dynamic questions that we hope will uh, spur some good conversation and debate today. Um, and just to reiterate, the, uh, the value will come from each of uh, the viewers really fielding questions in the Q&A section um, so that we can make the most of the time with the panellists we have with us today. So if I could just uh, ask each of our panellists to introduce themselves. Firstly, we have uh, George Gürtel from um, Uxus. Thank you. Hi. Well, yes. Um, thank you, Kirsten. My, my name is George Gottel. I'm uh, the Chief Creative Officer and Founder of Uxus. We are a end-to-end -end consumer experience design agency. We create uh, consumer experiences not only in the built environment, but also what we call the intangible aspect of consumer experience, which is the scripting of services and rituals. Uh, we work with a lot of multinational, big multinational companies all over the world, uh, McDonald's, Shell, uh, Sephora. We even designed the Tate Modern uh, new retail uh, space that they did a few years ago. So we're very familiar with uh, the whole high street and uh, consumer and retail. Fantastic. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we then got Becky Jones from uh, Appear Here. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Becky. I'm Head of Partnerships at Appear Here. If you don't 
know that much about us. Think of us a bit like Airbnb, but for retail space, uh, particularly flexible retail space. We've got a community of uh, just over 250,000 brands now that are looking for space <clears throat> on the streets. Um, and we've got global offices, but we are very much a British business. And that's where the, the majority of our base is. So particularly interested in all of these conversations today to see how we can help those guys out. Fab. Thank you, Becky. Uh, we then got Fergal O'Mullane from Validify. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Fergal. I'm a CEO of um, Validify, and basically, we are an innovation platform for retailers and consumer brands to help them find uh, technology for their businesses and help them to innovate, particularly. And we're particularly busy working with over 500 retailers here in the UK to identify the right technology for them to navigate through the current crises and apply technology to help them <clears throat> to reopen stores safely, to kind of create theater in their store, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we're obviously particularly interested in this subject matter because we talk to retailers every day about their problems and how to kind of reinvent their stores in this crisis. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And last but not least, um, Simon Quinn, co-chair of the Institute of Place Management um, and Government Task Force. Thanks, Kirsten. Yes, co-chair of the Institute of Place Management, executive director of the High Streets Task Force, which has been set up by government to support local authorities and other place leaders as we try to get the change that is necessary in town centres. It's an alliance of placemaking experts who are working with local places. I'm also Professor Elrill Fellow in Place Management Practice at Manchester Metropolitan University and I've worked in town centres as a researcher, a policy influencer and a place practitioner for 30 years. Fantastic, thank you very much Simon. Uh, thanks again to all of you for uh, giving up time during your day today to, to contribute. Um, so really quickly just to set the scene uh, once again, um, just some sort of key call outs from, uh, you know, why we're talking about this particular subject today. Um, London's West End and Mayfair would expect typically to receive over 200 million visitors each year. Um, although the UK currently has the world's third most developed e-commerce market with 20% of all sales now taking place online, um, until the pandemic, shoppers still wanted to visit flag flagship stores, uh, clustered together, creating a, a memorable experience and stimulating ideas. Um, they still really wanted to experience that physical environment. Uh, clearly now disruption is everywhere from Amazon to WeWork um, and has, has been uh, accelerated by the pandemic, obviously uh, in the online sense. Um, uh, a lot of e-commerce businesses have absolutely catapulted in terms of uh, their sales projections. Um, so high streets everywhere are really having to respond to this uh, using in-store technology, uh, data-driven retail, um, and uh, really looking at their business models and turning them upside down. So the government has recognised that high streets are um, really facing intense pressures now to have a set-up task force, uh, and hence why IOMA have brought together a group of retail and innovators to innovators to feed their ideas into the task force. So we really hope, and I reiterate again, that you can feed in your suggestions. And I thought it would be really helpful. I was reading the paper this morning and just a, a couple of uh, call-outs just, I mean, this was literally over three or four pages of the, the newspaper this morning, but... You know, I think all very typical of what's happening at the moment. We've got ASOS uh, announcing quadrupling of profits uh, with three million new customers. So a clear switch to online. We've got gourmet burger kitchen closures. So less people going out to eat. Uh, we've got Just Eat uh, reporting order growth with a 46% jump in their th third quarter to 151 million. So more people staying at home, stopping going from the high streets. Cineworld closing almost all of its screens globally uh, and then Mindful, uh, Mindful Chef um, currently in negotiations with Nestle uh, reporting sales of 50 million this year so lots of things being talked about that really are taking um, our physical shoppers away from the high street. So I'm going as I said we've got some fantastic questions to sort of generate some, some conversations I reiterate again please uh, log your questions on the screen below but I'm going to start off by um, directing the first question to Fergal from uh, Validify um, and Fergal my question uh, to you is um, as I just mentioned uh, clearly uh, we're over six months on from a new way of life around the world for all of us um, <clears throat> clearly the consumer shopping experience has changed 
Do you believe this is for good? Well, I think some of these patterns are definitely going to stick uh, long after the pandemic is in the rear view mirror. Um, I mean, what we are seeing and what we're, what we're hearing from retailers is, is that essentially what the pandemic has done has uh, accelerated the inevitable. So there was always this move to kind of digital. There was always, um, you know, a need for these retailers to start innovating and become you know, digital first um, in terms of their mindset and connecting their stores, to their online experience, et cetera. And a lot of times, you know, they just were playing lip service to that in terms of innovation uh, before the pandemic. And actually now this has really kind of forced the agenda with them. And, you know, I think ultimately that, you know, this, you know, what we were looking at before the pandemic in the high street was quite generic, uh, quite boring, stores and experiences and there are going to be a lot of casualties but i think what we'll see is that those ones the businesses that survive they're going to be a lot more innovative delivering a much better customer experience mm -hmm. it'll be a much more interesting experience for customers and a much more joined up uh, experience between the stores and online mm -hmm. becky i saw you shaking your head there did you have anything to add to that no, I completely agree. I guess not to get too philosophical about it. The thing that if you think back to the very first instance of shopping, which is like maybe the Greek agora, which literally <laughs> means gathering place. Like I think, you know, the world's seen God knows how many pandemics and natural disasters and things since then. I think that kind of need to gather and meet and connect and typically commerce is a way of doing that is still kind of a fundamental part of human nature so i think that will always continue but i completely agree with fergal in that the i guess the way we're shopping now has had started to change prior to this and has been completely accelerated by the pandemic and i guess what that means is that the role of the store is no longer just about transactions if you look at like my my 70 year old aunt who had never really touched the laptop in her house before the pandemic is now completely comfortable online shopping. Mm -hmm. So what she wants when she goes into John Lewis, which is her favorite shop, is something very, very different than just getting what she used to get. So I think the store now is much more about media space. It's about storytelling. It's about building communities as opposed to just that transaction. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a danger though that we may come full circle um, and really crave that, um, that sort of human interaction and good old fashioned service eventually once again? Oh, 100%. I mean, I, I think people are craving it now. I think mm -hmm. they're just concerned um, about the safety of, of what they're doing and what, what is possible. So I don't think the urge necessarily has gone anywhere. I think if anything, it's stronger than ever and it's reminding people that that's how they want to spend their lives. It's just that right now they're holding back on doing it. We need to find ways to, to, uh, to, to, to make that happen then in physical space, don't we? Yeah, and I think just uh, to add to that, and you know, we were talking to the, the British Retail Consortium yesterday and about their statistics and you know, footfall is definitely still significantly down. I think 30% overall, way more than that in the kind of inner city kind of areas. But actually the kind of average order and the kind of um, propensity, those going into the stores making purchases is way up um, because, you know, they're much more kind of, they're going in for a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and they really want to kind of go in, but, you know, so it's those retailers that are connecting their online and their stores and making that kind of seamless experience so you can check whether those products are available before you go into the store are the ones that are winning mm -hmm. kind of environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the fluidity between online and offline has always been there and the pandemic has accelerated it. So, you know, I mean, consumers don't think about channels. They don't think about physical versus virtual. They use the tools they need. And, you know, like we mentioned earlier, it's also the human need of connecting and experiencing things together. Another option in terms of the choices that you have living in a city for leisure and entertainment, retail is one of those things. And the pandemic has accelerated the need for retail to be entertainment versus just transactional. Yeah. I just come in on that. The, the, there is also the convenience factor that is having an impact at the moment. So during the lockdown period, district centres only saw their footfall fall by 34% across the UK, whereas centers, larger cities saw 79% fall. 
And it's the larger cities that are still struggling to get footfall back, not just because it's shoppers, but others. But many of our smaller towns, coastal towns in particular, have seen footfall return to the levels of last year already. So people are comfortable in a place that they live close to, they can walk into or cycle into. So yes, there's a difference between what we have to do in cities and what perhaps is benefiting smaller centres at this stage. So Simon, just on that point, um, so you, you quoted the, uh, I think, minus 34 in, in smaller districts, minus 79 in cities. Clearly, online digital market, um, uh, the online digital market share will be having a, an impact on that. It's probably one of the largest ones because people can obviously have been shopping from home. But uh, what do you think remain the sort of remainder of in terms of largest threats? So things like, you know, so working from home, people not wanting to use uh, public transport, um, where we've had to sort of close historic uh, destinations. How, how do we overcome some of those more external factors and getting people into cities? Well, I think, first of all, we should just say that we are in a way lucky that this pandemic hit us now and not 15 years ago, because <laughs> a lot of, you know, online shopping, a lot of uh, our connecting like this would not then have been possible. So in many ways, you know, we had got to just that stage of evolution where we could ad adapt to this. So we saw many uh, retailers who were not previously visible online find ways of going online, even if it was just through working together in towns in order to then take orders and arrange home delivery. Mm -hmm. um, but that response, you know, has got us so far but I think what the big challenge for cities is, yes, people using public transport to travel in. They seem very uh, unhappy about that. Remember that the office buildings in major cities are often quite tall. So you have issues about getting staff in lifts in order to move them through. I think smaller towns, low rise offices, people are going back into them and using them. The big cities, you know, the universities are now back, but they're not being encouraged to be out and about. So that is having an impact. Conference business has disappeared to this format, so we're, you're not attracting people in from that. International tourists and visitors, hotels are still empty. So those are challenges that until we get some greater control over the virus, I think mm. are going to be real. Mm. How, how do you think we can overcome your, your point there about people uh, you know, making the journey into offices and clearly that has a, a commercial impact on uh, transport, on... Uh, local commerce, on uh, food and beverage, on the use of office space. How else is it possible for us to find a way to get uh, people into city centres to work? So for example, I mean, I'm obviously working from home at the moment, but I am desperate to get out the house now and again, and I'm looking for somewhere locally. Um, what can we do in some of the larger cities to get people to actually want to go in and, and do some work, assuming obviously they're allowed to? I think there's going to have to be a, an adaption because, again, survey after survey is saying people you know, want to actually be working at home more. They don't feel that they need to go into an office five days a week. Companies are seeing some benefits that may come from this, thinking in longer term about cutting their office costs, etc. But, you know, we need I, I don't think we can permanently all work from home. Um, I think it's going to have to be a place where people want to go. Uh, at times to you know help develop new people in offices build that sense of community and cohorts but a lot of younger uh, office workers yes seem quite comfortable being in cities mm. as people get older now I think you know they're thinking I commute in an hour in the morning an hour in the evening think of all that time I have been wasting so there's a consumer issue as well as the practicality now I think mm. I think one of the, the challenges as well that we're you know I'm seeing is a lot of these big businesses with office space in uh, city centres, etc. They're telling their staff to not bother coming in now until mm -hmm. you know probably mm -hmm. two of next year, and I think that's going to be the biggest, you know, one of the biggest kind of factors in terms of getting footfall back to some of these really inner city areas. That actually a lot of these big corporates are kind of just taking the stance that okay, everybody can work from home until at least the end of um, March, that kind of thing. So, you know, f in the short term, that's going to be a big impact for inner cities. Thank you. Um, okay, oh, so... I'm just sorry, just... In of course, Becky, carry on. Um, on Simon's point, I think it's something we've been seeing that's really interesting, even just within London, between the neighbourhood style locations and then the actual city centre. So we've seen some brands that we've put into 
Columbia Road or Broadway Market or places like Deptford do really, really well. And then we've, we've seen really low demand, obviously, for those city centre destinations. I think we've, we're trying to, to figure out how we kind of help everyone in our community. So that's people in all, the, all different locations. Um, they're kind of set on the online side, although I think there's a massive gap for like the mum and pop shops who maybe don't have that digital skill set um, mm-hmm. and can't really link it in. But for our guys, that, that's kind of okay. I think what, what they've been saying to us is they'd love to see something like the Eat Out to Help Out book for retail. I think that had a good impact on the, um, I think it maybe if it had been restricted to locals or independents only, it might've had an even bigger impact. Um, but I think did really help the hospitality sector at that time obviously Mm. not necessarily now um but something like that particularly over christmas if you look at that being like a just completely crucial period for a lot of retailers i think a lot of them are you know thinking that christmas sales will really help them out and if it doesn't there's probably going to be a cliff edge in january where we see a lot of businesses go under Mm. Mm. it's a worrying time very worrying time um Next question, actually, Becky, if I can ask this one to you. Um, how can local councils and landlords um, ensure that consumers feel the journey? I think we just, you've obviously just talked about, you know, sort of smaller brands and keeping it local. Um, but obviously thinking from a city perspective, um, what other uses can city high streets be adapted for in addition to coffee shops and restaurants and bars? Obviously, you know, fantastic, your sort of Airbnb uh, retail pop-up um, approach but what else can we be doing to get people to actually want to come into the cities i think i think there's a few things i think if you look at the way like soho closed its streets um over summer when they had eating outdoors was incredible for attracting footfall i know in new york they've i think they've extended it to uh an annual thing and they've set up competitions for different architecture and design firms to figure out the solution for winter proofing it because obviously no one wants to sit outside in January in the rain in the middle of London <laughs> they any kind of, you can use <laughs> yeah so not that um and then I think it's, it's just thinking a bit more more flexibly if you're looking at kind of place making or destination creation as you would a tv network or a magazine you need to have the best content and it needs to rotate with what's relevant and that was true before the pandemic and still after and now i guess even more there needs to be something there that people maybe can't get online or something that's time sensitive or a different reason for them to go as opposed Mm -hmm. to everything that now they can just get from a laptop yeah fantastic um anybody got anything to add I was just going to ask, I mean, I know before the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about pedestrianising streets and kind of, you know, creating these boulevards that allows them for lots of activities on the street. Do you, is there any kind of signs that that is something that now the government is looking at to kind of, you know, start uh, kind of, you know, really accelerating those plans? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work being done on this now. I mean, it was Milan who said right at the beginning of the, the lockdown that what this meant was their visions for 2030 they were going to put into action this summer in 2020. So closing highways, opening up space for pedestrians and other cities have been following this all over North America or all in the UK. Much of the reopening high street safely initiatives clo- involve the closing of uh, streets to vehicles. Now there are some complaints from small traders about this but the only way you could physically get people into those streets was to uh, pedestrianise them. And many local authorities now are looking to make this permanent. So mm-hmm. creating much more space in towns and cities so that events can go on once we can put that sort of thing in, you know, entertainment, other things that make a visit to town different, you can have pop-up shops, markets, all the kinds mm-hmm. of things of that kind, which I think will make a great difference. And many of the big city squares, which were just uh, roundabouts at one point, now may potentially offer space to recolonize the uh, the physical area. Simon, what's your view then from uh, where, where we've got regional uh, shopping centres within a city? What's your view then? Because obviously that is already clearly pedestrianised because it's a covered shopping centre. Uh, what can be done to differently to pull in uh, customers in those locations? It's probably a good question for George as well, I think, from a sort of creative environment perspective as well. well let me tell you what the data says on those at the moment. 
that they are the least used places in terms yeah. of the return. People are reluctant still to go into covered spaces. The French government's just banned people from going into covered shopping centres in the major cities. So, you know... What can we do? What can we do to get some people in there? Well, we can't do anything if the government is saying you can't do it. Um, and, but then, you know, one of the problems, I think, was that people relax quite a lot, thinking that we could... Some younger people were going into places and, the, you know, the evidence seems to be that this was not great to be in crowds, whether it be inside any covered building or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some of the, be the pubs and gatherings they were having. And so I, I do not think I, I can come up with an answer as to how you can get <laughs> people into covered malls in a hurry. Any of our, any of our other panellists have a view on that? Well, I mean, and think, yeah, we have to think uh, you know, uh, uh, post COVID, because there's no way that people are going to go into spaces right now. There's still a lot of fear. Um, here in Holland, it's been very, I live in Amsterdam. So, you know, here in Holland, it's been very relaxed. And we've seen a huge surge of infections again. So it's, it's, it proves that, you know, you can't just let people go into covered large spaces together without having an infection uh, mm. surge. So, Post-COVID, I think, I don't think it's going to be take much to get anybody to go back anywhere. I mean, even with the fear of infection, people still go, right? So imagine once it says they're, it's okay, it's, people are going to yeah. surge back. And I don't remember who said it, you know, if it was Becky or Simon who said, there's still that desire. If anything, there's more of a desire than ever. You know, I'm very disappointed. Last night, they just announced here in Holland that they're shutting all the restaurants so depressing it's the only escape i had you know to kind of relax and enjoy and feel human now because the the surge of infection it's closed mm -hmm. so i think it's not going to take much to get people to go back i think mm -hmm. what's changed is the habit it's <laughs> how people shop it's like I you know what becky said about her 70 year old grandmother being able to use a laptop now that's the huge shift is that people are more digitally savvy they're more fluid with the virtual and, and brick and mortar. And so what does that mean in terms of purchase? If transactional purchases that are really ordinary can take place digitally and delivered to your home, then there's no need to go to those locations to pick up goods. So those locations then have to change what they present in order to get people to go in. And that's the big question I think that all the brands are searching for. The other issue, and I think this is something, I'm not sure if it, who said it, but it's equalizing the experience because of the fluidity that consumers have in terms of moving between these virtual and brick and mortar experiences, they have to be equal if you're a brand, that the, that the virtual or the digital experience has to be equally as powerful and as engaging as the brick and mortar one. You know, and, and I think often it's usually converse if it's a really strong brand. I mean, imagine, you know, a Nike innovation center, like a, you know, Nike town or whatever, really interesting to go into in terms of shopping and discovery and excitement and, is their online experience equally as good? Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we can't just say it's all about digital because that's not really the problem. But the problem is the shift of mindset between transactional buying and experiential buying. That's mm -hmm. the big shift. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that you have to crack. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like people, even luxury brands used to rely on heritage. Well, for millennial high net worth individuals, heritage doesn't really matter very much. So hence Bentley. They need to update. They need to create something exciting and, and you know, really engaging with these new, new consumers. Their aspirations are very different. So I think that's what we're going to be facing post-COVID more than anything else. And um, actually, one of the questions I was going to go on to ask you, George, was around, you know, sort of the creating fear and customer interaction. Um, you know, what else is there that's not already being done by the likes of Apple and Nike and, and Selfridges that are, you know, coming up with some fantastic events sort of regularly? What else is there that has not already been explored we can start tapping into? Well, there isn't really, um, other than we have to look outside of the West, because I think in Asia, they've already developed this very new way of shopping. So retail has become much more about showroom kind of experiences, theater and art versus simply, you know, purchasing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we, when we talk about retail in the future, it doesn't necessarily mean like, okay, here's an example. Amazon is really pushing to open physical stores. Like why am the leading, you know, e-commerce retailer in the world is pushing to open physical stores. Why? 
because their return rate is so high and it's costing them a fortune. People buy television sets on Amazon. They hate them. They have the highest return rate of all the product categories on Amazon televisions. Who would have thought, right? Mm -hmm. And so imagine Pat trying to repack a TV and ship it back to Amazon. How many of those TVs survive their journey back to Amazon? You know, so it's costing them a ton of money. So what they'd rather do is open an amazing physical location where consumers can explore products, decide what they like, and just take their phone right there on the spot and say, TV sent to my house, done. That's the new store. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, you know, we have to have this shift of like every size of every item on the rack, you know, that kind of thing has to go away. It's more about sampling, experiencing in real life, you know, and, and then ordering it, having it either delivered to your house or delivered to a point that's convenient. Yeah, and there's that's... a Swedish, uh, just one more example, there's a Swedish post office that has a changing room. So when you go to pick up your, your clothing that you've ordered, you can actually try it on right there in the post office. If you hate it, <laughs> repack it and say bye bye and send it back. I mean, how convenient is that, you know? Versus like having to schlep it back and do, you know, it's that kind of thinking. We have to really look at, I don't like to think of channels because, you know, omni-channel, in my opinion, is already dated. It's consumer channel. You have to look at the behavior of the consumer and cater to that to create convenience. That's what will stick. <laughs> that Swedish post office calling. Uh, yeah, it looks that way. Uh, they're obviously very happy <laughs> that I've mentioned them idea. on this channel. <laughs> oh, no, sorry about that. I don't know how that happened. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and just actually on a practical level, um, in terms of what George was saying, in terms, you know, consumers don't see channels. They just want to engage with the brand. And if they like it, great. You know, traditionally, online conversion rates um, for a brand might be 1% or 2%, you know, really, really low. If you go to a store, it's like in the 30s, that kind of thing. What we're seeing now is the brands are really kind of bringing the store experience online. And so, you know, you see technologies where store staff are engaging with the consumer online and they're now seeing conversion rates more like if they were in stores. And then they get the option as a consumer, once they've decided to make a purchase, to they can either go down to that store and collect it themselves or get it to fill directly from that store. A lot of consumers, mm -hmm. they want to get that product now. They don't want to wait for it to be delivered. So they want to kind of, once they've decided they want it, they can tear down to that shop, you know, test, check it, make sure they're happy with it and take it away there and then. So it's that really kind of connected experience is, is the way so, forward, you know? So Fergal, with my feet firmly in it, just because of my background, firmly in the, the bricks and mortar world, a, a channel of retailing, um, all of that completely makes sense and absolutely is now the way that, that, that our consumers are shopping. And, um, you know, as we've, we've few, you've mentioned, you know, that clearly there will always be a need to have a physical space to create that environment and, and keep the brand alive, whether it's a curation. However, in the current um, climate where, um, you know, people are offloading uh, employees, they are having to reduce uh, their trading hours, they are having to uh, actually keep the stores closed completely. They uh, are buying less, so there are less deliveries going in. How do we um, make it possible to that we keep them sort of uh, modus operandi efficient? So, you know, again, in my experience, you would have loan working probably in your smallest of stores, uh, stores in your smallest of villages. I think the reality of single and loan working in a large city store now is actually quite real. Um, how do we keep that efficient and um, you know profitable where footfall is clearly an issue? Well, we've been seeing a lot of retailers take you know great initiative around the purpose of their stores. So you know traditionally where you're just this destination to make a purchase, just a lot of times uh, store staff are just uh, standing around doing nothing quite a lot of the time. But now that's really changing. So. <clears throat> You know, for instance, we were talking to Anthropology when um, the uh, pandemic hit. First of all, they had the ability to fulfill uh, orders from their stores. So they became kind of mini warehouses, which obviously it allowed them to kind of uh, continue to use their store staff to kind of do that. They also got their store staff to start doing some of their customer uh, service calls. 
So again, kind of engaging with um, the customers and, you know, those store staff have a huge wealth of knowledge in terms of products. So leveraging all of that to kind of deliver a better customer experience, use it as a fulfillment point, use it as a pickup point and kind of, and also, like I said, you know, using them to engage with customers online, whether, you know, through conversation, mm -hmm. community tools or video to help with that online purchase. So that's what we really need. You know, the best retailers are already well on their way to kind of delivering that joined up experience. And, and that's really what you need to do so that your business is completely adaptable and flexible, no matter what kind of situation happens. And we don't know whether the stores are going to be forced to close in a couple of weeks time or not, but it, those brands like Anthropology can keep going because they've got that uh, agility within their business already. <clears throat> but to, to Fergal's point also, it's just it's go, it's, it's the brand going to the consumer. I mean, one of the things, for example, that Ikea is doing now is they're really pushing for urban stores. So they're pushing for these smaller uh, stores that carry more of the home accessories. The full range of Ikea products are available virtually. So it's more of, again, that showroom point where they're going to go to consumers who normally would have to get, you know, on public transport or whatever, or get an Uber to go out to the middle of nowhere to an Ikea store and have a hot dog and buy their furniture and come home again. Mm -hmm. Now they'll be conveniently located. I mean, what Simon was talking about, the, the, the kind of town center mentality is definitely the future for cities. Mm -hmm. creating small centers in a large urban metropolitan area where people can behave like they would be in a small town, mm -hmm. which is more environmentally sound as well. What's interesting is that we've seen the other way. Um, those stores that are overexpanded to be in almost every high street have now found they don't need to be. They don't need 250 outlets. They reduced gradually to 70, some down to 50. And IKEA, I think, is coming in from the other side, um, saying, let's go to some of these places that are still clearly retailing centres. And 19% of town centres still draw in more customers for retailing than for anything else. So you'll end up with good quality retailing, different experiences, that sense of things in those places. And I think those cities, and it's mainly cities, will be still great retailing destinations, offering something completely different. Whereas the next tier down, all those things that used to be ranked 50 to 250 in the retail hierarchy, hierarchy are beginning to adapt and say retail is not the prime reason people are coming in. Mm -hmm. And they're opening things like health centers and gyms and physical activity. They're bringing back civic services and community things. They're bringing back education into towns and city centers. And thinking again that these are the vibrant multifunctional community hubs. Now, not enough of them are doing it. There's not the leadership necessarily around to help that. And that's what the task force is going to try and do to support those people in those places to make the right decisions and rethink the considerable amount of empty retail space they're going to have and do something else. I but the core cities, I think, are going to be very strong. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think this idea of multifunctional. I mean, this is we call this the everywhere store. This is for us, you know, if you yeah. have one of these, you can buy anything, anytime, anywhere. So why do you need to go into a city center for? Yeah. And, and creating multi, multi experiential points where you can do different activities, you can, you know, enrich your life in some way and create a benefit. That's what's going to matter. You know, the stores that Simon mentioned, the ones that have like 350, you know, locations in London alone are, are those were transactional points every single one of those retail locations wasn't a shining example of what a consumer experience should be, you know? So, I mean, look at Selfridges. It's this huge magnet for people because Selfridges is such a wonderful experience to go to. It's entertaining. It's, it, it offers you again, multidimensional experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, town centers now have to look at themselves and high streets have to look at themselves, not as high streets in the traditional sense mm -hmm. of it being about only consumption. It can be about other things too that also generate revenue. I think, I think on a smaller level that I completely agree with, with the last few points that have been made. I think if you look at the small independent stores, what we've seen 
where brands have done something really well. It's not big and it's not flashy. They've just been the expert on their product and they've maybe curated a beautiful store and they've put a few of their products in there and they've been able to build a relationship with customers that walk in and they know everything about it and they know everything about how it was made and how it came to be and the inspiration behind it. And I just think there's something really... There's, there's so many big ideas that, that could really help, but for individual stores looking to do a good job, sometimes it's just a case of being the expert on your brand mm -hmm. and focusing on that much smaller community. Because if you think back to going to like a local butchers or something, half yeah. of the time you would go because one, you wanted to know what, exactly where that product came from. You maybe wanted to know how to cook it, but you also knew the person there and you wanted to have a chat and have a debrief on your day. And I think that's something to Simon's point that, that we've seen a shift back towards, which I actually think is lovely and is something that we should focus on and, and not really lose. Um, and then there's very much to Fergal's point, there's a company I was thinking of in New York, there's a homeware brand called Roman and Williams Guild. And they've, they've got a, a beautiful cafe in the, their building, their retail space anyway, but obviously they've seen the footfall completely die off in New York and Soho over lockdown. What they've done is they've repurposed all their store staff to be online design consultants. So very wow. much they're using that yeah. expertise, but for the online purpose and they retain all their staff and their staff are happy and they're growing and developing and their customers still have that community sense with them. Yeah, super smart. I mean, we're talking a lot about built things, but the reality is people will travel for other people. If, if you, I mean, to your point, you know, Becky, about going to have the expertise, it, a small mom, pa retailer who has an incredibly curated selection of the highest quality stuff, they know it inside and out, you will definitely go and make the effort to experience that. It doesn't have to be about this big theatrical, you know, extravaganza. It is we're, we're not even talking about service here because service plays a very critical role in consumption and why you buy something. So I think, you know, even just training people or training your staff or you yourself, if you're an owner of a store, giving high level service is enough for someone to go there. George, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to stop you there. I'm conscious of time. You've actually got quite a few questions that have come through, which is brilliant. Uh, so I wanna make sure that we've, uh, we've got enough time to answer the majority of those, as many as possible. Um, I think we've pretty much um, answered all of the questions that uh, I wanted to ask the panel today. Um, yeah, I think we're good on the questions. I'm actually gonna to go to uh, the Q&A now. We're just coming up to, uh, to 2.45. Uh, I'm just going to pick through uh, some that I believe we haven't answered. So, um, okay, this is a good one, actually. This comes from uh, John Andrews. We were obviously talking about uh, decline in footfall in, in city centres and the impact on uh, footfall. What um, are we going to do about city and town centres and cars? Probably a good one for Simon Quinn there. <laughs> There's two contradictory things going on. Um, everyone, everyone had um, thought that one of the things that might come out of this was because we are making space in town centres and city centres now for pedestrians. Um, this fits with uh, you know, achieving uh, steps towards climate change and that we're going to reduce the dominance of cars. But of course, people feel safer in cars than they do on public transport now. So whilst we might have more cyclists coming into our city, I think we've, until we get rid of COVID, uh, we're not going to be able to push in car reduction coming into our towns and city centres. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I've got another one here, probably actually, Simon, for you. Can the councils not reutilise space for local working hubs to enable local people to live, work and spend locally? Rather than spend all their money on time consuming, expensive travel, uh, people would therefore be able to spend more money on buying products from their local shops. Yeah, I promise you this is happening um, in many small towns as well, that um, space that has become available is now being used. This will grow because this was happening before COVID. Um, but if more people are working at home for at least some of the week, there are day, times in the, at home you may not want to be there. The kids come home or whatever you might prefer to go and sit in a sort of slightly managed office space or at least a place where you can get together and uh, you know, work through the rest of your day and just meet some other workers for a change. So I, I expect we're gonna see a very significant rise in this kind of space being created. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Simon. Um, I've got another one here, which uh, is interesting. Um, the question is from an anonymous attendee, but I think it's a really pertinent one. Uh, does retail and FSB need to lobby to ensure that the COVID-19 approach is based upon the infection demographics, i.e. focused on workplaces, education, care homes, uh, not on imposing rules about meeting groups of six, socially distanced in restaurants, etc. Who'd like to take that one? Um, I think it's not me. <laughs> I, think, I think, yes, based on the fact that if you look at retail as an industry, it's the biggest employer in the private sector. So if, if that's not essential, I don't know what is. Um, and then if you look at the actual kind of practices people have put in place in retail stores versus other exposure points, I think there's, you know, a, a, a huge, and again, obviously the stores are being closed down even in the tier three locations we've got now. I say this as, as in a tier three location currently, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but I think it goes back to that confidence piece in the, I think that does, I know certainly the beauty industry had a, a bit of a lobbying campaign when they were talking about, um, led by Sharma Dean Reid um, from Beauty Stat, looking at how they're such a hygienic um, industry anyway. So they're completely set up for COVID restrictions and managing that. And I think there, there would be merit in something similar for um, consumer confidence, I think, mm -hmm. in retail. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, I think there's a real worry about, you know, retail industry, obviously, but the hospitality industry is under tremendous threat. And I don't think the evidence is there. The more we're hearing about hospitality be, being restricted in the way that it is. I mean, th there's a lot of research now that seems to be showing household, um, you know, infection rather than actually people being out. Although the stu some students might um, have skewed the data recently. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think we probably can fit one more in. Uh, we are only 71 days away from Christmas. I hate to remind you all. Um, I'm sure most of you started your Christmas shopping, but um, how will the, uh, the, the city high streets attract our customers over Christmas? I think we've sort of touched on it very briefly, but, you know, you know, Going back to my store manager days, uh, you know, 50% of our, our turnover in some of the, the branches that I worked in came within those six week periods of Christmas. So what are we going to do in our high streets to make sure that we've got footfall coming still um, to, to drive footfall? Well, again, I can just pitch in first. Obviously, some of the big city Christmas markets, the German markets, are not going to be happening this Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a challenge. Um, I don't, I think looking at the footfall data now, we are not going to be anywhere near 2019 in footfall and in spend this year. Yeah, I think it, realistically, you know, there is going to be a big drop in footfall in stores, but I think a lot of store, you know, brands can do a lot to make sure that when the customer, you know, some customers, particularly with clothing and things like that, they really want to kind of test, you know, touch it, etc. So they need to make sure that the customer can make sure that the, their sizes and what they're looking for on it, is a, that information is available online to make sure that when they go into the store that that product is there. Also, we're seeing a huge surge in a kind of appointment settings. So technologies that can help people to kind of set an appointment, what time that they come in, and also that when they do get there that they can be alerted when their appointment time is like five minutes away to 10 minutes away. So they don't need to be kind of standing in a queue, which may have been okay when it was glorious sunshine in the summer, but not so good when it's pouring rain in the winter. Mm. I, I really feel like there does need to be some kind of demand stimulus though. Cause you've got, you've got the confidence issue on one side, but you've also got consumer spend and actual income levels. If you think that a ton of the country have been on furlough, people's jobs are unstable, there's, there's so much uh, clouding that as well. Like in, in my family, we've had conversations very depressingly that I said no to, like, do we want to have Christmas or should we not? <laughs> should we do it just very small this year? I'm like, no, of course not. Like something needs to be, you know, needs to bring joy to our lives. But I think budgets are tight and people aren't going to be splashing the cash very likely as much as, as they have been willing to do. So mm -hmm. anything, and I, I can't really see, see a way of that, that 
being helped if it doesn't come from a government level. Um, and we just have one, thank you for that. Um, we've had one final question. I think we've got just time for one more. Um, the, and as I say, it's probably Becky best answer to this one, but we, I said we've, we've talked about sort of flexible space and the fact that there's now, uh, you know, a growing number of empty units on our high streets that uh, require some attention or some love. Um, one of my questions I actually was going to ask you earlier, Becky, was do, have you had much interest from any pure play retailers? So those that would typically only deal online that are wanting to go into a physical space is my first question. Uh, and then my second question is, uh, do you foresee there being um, a sort of last minute dash uh, from brands or businesses to find a, a sort of pop up or sort of temporary space in the lead up to Christmas? So my answer typically in every other year would be yes, we always see a last minute dash when everyone wants a space and we've, we've, we're completely maxed out occupancy wise. Um, and yes, we see a ton of, of pure play retailers looking to do um, offline things or even people, brands that typically have um, those kind of, you know, legacy brands with 250 stores are actually looking at doing something a bit different. So they're taking like one store on a road show around the country to see the same kind, basically, like George was saying, taking the store to the audience. Um, this year, obviously, a little bit different. I, I have no, we, we can't really predict our demand anymore. So I couldn't tell you what we're going to expect next week because things are changing so, so, so quickly. Uh, we're definitely still seeing people want to do things more than really we thought we would. Um, we are on the flip side also seeing a lot of brands just, just holding out until April, summer next year to try and see if that's a better, cool. better time to do cool. it. There's, there's some really interesting stuff going on with some of the smaller brands that are kind of more willing to take risks than than other yeah. ones um and we're seeing particularly with the kind of a, a big rise in stores that are selling more essential goods so there's a beautiful um fishmongers called notting hill fish shop who's opened a couple of permanent stores with us Fabulous. over lockdown actually mm -hmm. and his sales are through the roof and one little thing that they did is they started putting seating outside. So when people were queuing in their socially distant space and it was taking quite a long time, they were connecting. So they're now building out this neighborhood model. So there's good stuff, but it's obviously not a normal year. So my final question to the panel um, is, uh, what can we learn from some of the great shopping destinations around the globe? You know, what, what have we seen that other uh, big international cities have embraced during this very strange time uh, to keep their consumers and shoppers happy? Probably a good one for you, George. Well, I mean, London is probably... <laughs> One of the most That's a great answer, you know, uh, answer. renowned destinations <laughs> in the world for shopping, and and you know, going back to the whole Christmas thing, I think that people look forward to the celebration of the holidays because you know Regent Street, Oxford Street light up, you know, they decorate, they create the atmosphere of the holidays, and I think that that would be one way to get people to get out and about. Now, whether they go in the store... The lights are going up in Oxford Street at the yeah, moment. Fabulous. And they yeah, should. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, that will create, you know, the sense of normalcy and a sense of excitement about the holidays. I mean, there's nothing like, uh, you know, like, you know, the windows of New York and the, the streets of London. I mean, those are things that create excitement around, you know, Christmas time. And I think that will help people definitely get out of the house because a, a, a good stroll is also extremely healthy for for you, you know. Um, unfortunately, whether they go in the stores to buy will be one thing, but the, 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 the retailers who present themselves well will be the ones that maybe stick in the mind of retailers when they go online to buy their gifts, you know. So I think that there's definitely this kind of peacock effect of the holidays that, that really should be leveraged uh, with brands in order to get top of mind with, with customers. Does anyone else have anything to add around that, Simon? I can see you nodding. Well, uh, just an, the experience has occurred during lockdown. As you know, Primark do not trade online, but during lockdown, Primark had built up a huge conversation through social media with their customers and far more interaction than any other multiple retailer, according to the people we work with who research this thing. So when they reopened their stores, they had huge queues. And it seems to me that Primark have discovered how to bond with some of their customers to gradually build the idea that they may 
um, you know, be comfortable in a Primark environment. And other multiple retailers, I think that's an opportunity for them in the uh, coming months. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're five minutes before uh, end, ending our webinar. I just want to say thank you to Simon, George, Becky and Fergal um, for your brilliant contribution today. Uh, and I'm going to hand back over to David um, from Myoma. Thank you, Kirsten. Well, thank you very much, Kirsten. I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion and the uh, panel's insight into what's happening on the city high street. So thank you very much to all our delegates to, um, for joining us this afternoon and for all the excellent questions that you've uh, posed to the, the panel. Uh, just to tell you that we will be holding another webinar in two weeks time where this webinar will be looking at the local high street rather than the, the city high street. So thank you once again for joining us. Uh, I would like now to ask you to uh, log off if you kindly would uh, to enable us to have a debriefing session with the panelists. As you log off, please remember to complete our feedback form and let us know what you thought of this webinar and what you would like to see at future events. Thank you. <laughs>